And welcome to our community. Susie Thomas with you this morning. We are visiting with Sherry McKinney France, uh, who is representing Frontline to Freedom and the Frontline to Freedom 3 mm-hmm. conference. Good morning. Good morning. Frontline to Freedom is about what, Sherry? Well, this is our third annual training that is sponsored in part by the Children's Network. So it's Frontline to Freedom 3. So we've done this two other years. Um, The first two years, Susie, we focused on sex trafficking right here in Stark County. And um, this year, we've taken a very different approach, and we are focusing on labor trafficking. So it's a whole day from registration begins at 8, it ends at 4, We're offering all kinds of CEUs and CMEs and CLEs and all kinds of letters for things. And people who need those know what those mean. (laughs) Yes, I hope so. Yes. Yes. Um, So we're offering all of those, and it will be an amazing day. You mentioned the Children's Network. That's who you really work for regularly. So that's a day job. Yes. Tell us a little bit about what that is and what you do. Sure. The Children's Network is the Child Advocacy Center for the county. And we, this is our 30th anniversary, which is a big deal. We were the first advocacy center in the state. And we serve children when there are concerns of sexual abuse, which is about 85% of our kids. Mm-hmm. And then we serve children um, when there is serious physical abuse, which to us is a hospitalization, something that's life-threatening. We also serve children who are victims of human trafficking, which is how I got involved in all of this. And then we also serve children who witness homicides in their own homes. Oh, my. Your job just has to be very difficult. Well, well, there are days, <laughs> yes, but it's so rewarding. Yes. And I have to say that really I work with incredible people. How did we even know, how did we get on our radar mm-hmm. the problem of sex trafficking in this area and particularly with children? You know, I am embarrassed to admit I've worked in this community a long time, my whole career. And when I went to the network in twenty. 20- 14, people started talking about human trafficking, and that was something that te- that the network was involved in. And me, working with kids my whole career, I looked at people and said, human trafficking in Stark County? In this day and age? Right. right. And I was very ignorant. I was very uninformed, very unaware. And I can tell you that in 2015, we identified seven victims. Hmm. And in 2016, we identified seven victims. And we have just identified our fifth potential victim this year. Already this year. Yes. And we're only this far into the year. Correct. And we're talking about people selling children. Correct. And these, uh, are they sold from their families? Are mm-hmm. they are these runaways who mm-hmm. suddenly fall all of the above? Yes. Generally speaking, and I hate to stereotype, but generally speaking, um, children who are trafficked um, are, come from very at-risk situations. They don't typically have strong connections with family members. They feel very isolated. They're alone. They may be in foster care. They may or may not be in school. They are runaways. They may or may not be drug involved, but kind of the rule of thumb is if they aren't drug involved, they will be drug involved because that's just part of the life. Um, But kids who are really struggling and don't have strong connections with people, that is who traffickers and recruiters really target and look for, and they are experts at picking them out. What age group are we talking about, Sherry? Uh, 12 to 17, the average uh, victim in Ohio is 13 when he or she um, goes into the life. And I think it's important for people to know we are not just talking about girls. I have seen statistics as high as, you know, 50, 60 percent are boys. So these are boys and girls. And I should also mention that LGBTQI youth are at a very high risk. Oh, my. I didn't even think to of be, that. Mm-hmm, a much higher risk. Wow. Uh, And, you know, in my mind, I picture your stereotypical sleazy guy hanging out in the bowling alley Mm -hmm. looking for somebody and or at the mall and say, oh, you ought to be a model. Mm -hmm. And a 12 or 13 year old girl falling for that. Mm -hmm. Is this the way it goes or how does it really happen? It absolutely could happen exactly like you described. The only thing that I would say is nowadays, and I don't know if this has changed over time, but they don't look sleazy. 
Mm. They're really sharp. Um, They may be really good looking. They're dressed to the nines. They have the right clothes and the right shoes and the right haircut and the right car. Um, So they could be, you know, in their 20s, like, quote, boyfriend material, or it could be an older person, a mom or a dad figure. And I also think it's important for us to point out that not all uh, pimps and recruiters are men, that um, we have had, wow, as many probably women recruit and uh, sell kids as we have men in Stark County. That's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it family. That's really unbelievable. Yes. What what leads to that happening? Oh, gosh. Now, if I knew that, I'd be on Oprah. Uh, Well, yes. (laughs) But I have to ask, what on earth happens in a family where you get to a family member selling another family member? Although Mm -hmm. I just got taken back to the story of Joseph Mm -hmm. and the the jealousy that was taking care of him. And didn't they sell him into slave slave labor? Yes. Yes. But... uh, so, boy, everything changes and nothing is different. Uh-huh. I think part of it that we have seen has been addiction. Yes. Um, and I'm not just talking about parents who sell their children, but I'm talking parents, step-parents, sisters. Part of it also is when we talk about human trafficking, this is a very organized um lucrative industry. This is not some fly by the seat of their pants. So this is a very sophisticated industry and um, a lot of gang activity. Mm -hmm. So you might have a sister who is involved with the gang and she is coerced to invite her sister to join them. Um, Either she's afraid for her life or she'll get brownie points with the boys if she does that. And so it's very complicated. So uh, trafficking, I think of people getting sold off and they're on a barge somewhere right. and they have no way of getting back home. Mm-hmm. You mean they are still staying local and they're they're trafficked locally, staying local, going home at night even? Some of them go home at night. Some of them are trafficked locally. Um, many of them are also trafficked in various other jurisdictions, cities, states, etc. Some people think that a person is not considered a victim of human trafficking unless they're physically moved from location to location. So Mm -hmm. let's say it's a child from Canton, but they send them to Cleveland. And that's a myth. Um, A kid could be trafficked in Canton and never leave Canton, and it is still considered human trafficking. Trafficking. Yes. What's the difference then? Is it a new term, human trafficking or sexual trafficking and prostitution? Is it one and the same? I'm so glad you asked. And last year at our Frontline to Freedom 2, we had a woman named Vanessa, who is from the Columbus area, speak. She's a survivor. (coughs) Excuse me. And she was remarkable. And she shared her own story. And she actually works now for the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office. And part of, and she's very funny. She uses a lot of humor. And one of the things that she says is that someday she looks at her coworkers and says, you know, you're the one who put me in jail. (laughs) So now she actually works alongside these people. And, you know, what a journey. I mean, what an amazing story story. of restoration. Yes. Yes. But um, at that training, it was very fascinating because one of the participants at the training raised her hand and said, when you were on the streets and like in the life, how many of the women, if you, if you can answer this, how many of the women that you were with were prostitutes and how many were victims of human trafficking? And she said, I don't know if you, and Vanessa said, oh, I, I can tell you exactly how many. Can you guess what she said? Uh, no, I can't. All of them were victims. None of them were, quote, yes. prostitutes. Yes. But I think in our society for so, for hundreds of years, we've had this, quote, prostitution philosophy that that's what they want to do and that this is a business like this is a 60 40 split that and that's not the case this is about people becoming property Mm -hmm. and it is a very very violent industry and saying no is not an option Mm -hmm. Um, changing your mind and leaving is not an option so really a lot of it Susie is 
us as a society reprogramming ourselves. Yes. Most people have seen the movie Pretty Woman. Right. It looks so glamorous. Oh, yeah. And right. it's so... And they fall in love at the end. Right. Yes. And he climbs up the fire oh, escape. Yeah. So it could not... That whole thing could not be further from the truth. Right. Right. Oh, my. You talk about, well, the success story that you just spoke about. Vanessa. Mm-hmm. And others that that are victims but somehow mm-hmm. are able to get away. Mm-hmm. How do we do that? How do we wow. help these people get away mm-hmm. and stay away from it, particularly if they're living in the same town? Mm-hmm. Uh, is this happening? Are we having some success with this? Or, uh, how do we, we do it? We are. We are. And we're learning to to gauge success. Um, you know, to me, initially, success was that we rescue this child and they never do this again and that they're safe and happy and mm-hmm. life is great and they go back to school and they have a supportive family. Yes. Um, that's pretty unrealistic. And mm-hmm. so we've kind of gauged. I mean, certainly it's a goal. But, you know, what we have found is first of all, and this might sound backwards, but most of the kids that are rescued are not happy to be rescued. They are not grateful. Really? Really. They see us as part of the problem because in their very brainwashed mind, they think that things were just fine, that this was their boyfriend or girlfriend And yes, this person might beat them up. And yes, these bad things happen. But this person, that is their person, even though there's probably six, five, six, seven, eight other victims in the quote stable is what they call it, Mm -hmm. the group. That child is so emotionally connected to the pimp that the child doesn't see themselves as a victim. And so they don't run over and hug us and thank us and, oh, I'm so grateful you're here. They're usually very angry and want to be back in the life, want to be back with that pimp. And it is a very, very long journey and a lot of work to reprogram thinking. Yes. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of support. And we've talked about the typical environment that our victims come from, that support is very, very lacking. You know, we have kids that are 17, 18 that haven't been in school for three years. Oh, my. They have children, oftentimes with their pimp, which, you know, that complicates things like a million times. Yes. And so it's just really complicated. So if we, I I think that most of my colleagues would say right now, if we keep the child away from the pimp, we view that as success. Okay. Um, that's one step. And then, but you know, it's, it's so hard, you know, we everybody s- has a cell phone and social media right, and right. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we have a, a special docket at family court. It's called the promise court. And that's the goal is to, this team meets every week with these victims and to like support them and help them and guide them and uh, nurture them. Hannah's house, I'm not sure if you're familiar. I am. Yeah, yes. Hannah's house mm-hmm. is very, very involved with us and mentors all of our victims. So it's it's just incredibly complicated work. This It's very interesting to hear you describe it. We hear about um, kidnap victims having mm-hmm. some kind of a an emotional attachment mm-hmm. built with their kidnapper. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably some kind of a survival Mm -hmm. uh, knee-jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. Um, It sounds almost like that, that this person is dangerous. And deep down, they must know this is a dangerous person to me. But if I do what they say, if I acquiesce in all ways, then they won't hurt me and I'll be okay. And that might be why the anger for someone pulling them away from them, I'm just guessing here. I think you're I think you're on target and I think part of it is fear of the unknown. Yes. You know, they kind of know what to expect from their pimp and from the stable, but if they don't have that family, then where do they go and what will happen and how will they survive and um again, they just they really lack that those social supports, those mm-hmm. healthy appropriate social supports. So again, just 
very complicated. Yeah, it, it certainly is. We're visiting with Sherry McKinney France. She is from the Children's Network and getting ready to host Frontline to Freedom 3. That will be taking place uh, at River Tree Christian Church on June 8th. We're going to have more information about that after these words. You're listening to our community. 